Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Commerce Show today. I just got out from the call with Aaron Sachs from West Coast Seeds. It has been amazing. One of my best podcasts. Of course, it's the second one. <laughs> no kidding. It was awesome. We did exchange on subjects like marketing, uh, logistics, because I met Aaron um, during a, a logistic project uh, with him. So it was very uh, awesome to be talking with him. We go, we went in depth about their social marketing strategy and how uh, do they uh, promote the lifestyle behind the brand. And it has been very interesting. Uh, be sure to subscribe if you like the content on Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, everything. <laughs> be sure to stay up to date. So every two weeks, uh, I'm going to be releasing an episode of The Commerce Show. I'm having a lot of fun doing it, and I'm sure I'm going to be doing it for a long time. Thank you, guys. The podcast starts right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome on The Commerce Show. Today, I'm receiving a good friend of mine, Aaron Sachs from West Coast Seeds. Hi, Aaron. Hey, Philip. Um, all right, so Aaron, you, you have a pretty uh, pretty nice background. Uh, for those who don't know you, um, you've started your career and uh, you were a senior accountant at uh, Ernst & Young. Uh, you have a corporate banking background also. Uh, you've joined uh, West Coast Seed since uh, 2016, um, and you recently uh, got the nomination to uh, become the president of the company in, back in December, I think. Um, you're also the president of uh, Urban B Supplies. I would talk about that later, but uh, I would love to know uh, uh, how, how you can sell bees online. But yeah, we're going to talk about it for sure. Um, also, I think you can be proud that you've raised over $150,000 for Food Banks Canada uh, in uh, your recent um, campaign for Dr. Uh, Booney Henry Seed uh, Blend uh, campaign, uh, as we can see right now on uh, your website. Um, you can also be proud, I, I think, that you've tripled the digit in terms of sales um, over the last two years. So uh, maybe, Aaron, just for a quick introduction, can you tell me a, a little bit, actually not only me, all our listeners, <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you went from banking to accounting and now selling uh, bees and seeds and all that stuff? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good. That's a good question. Uh, it could take a long time, probably longer than what we have on the podcast. But just, just in summary, basically, I started out in accounting. I went to McGill University, so I spent a lot of time in Quebec. Um, I studied accounting just because at that point in time, it was a. It, it had just been like 2008, and there was a financial crisis. And we were just on the recovery, I think, if I remember exactly with timing. And I thought, you know what, I need to guarantee myself a job. And I remember in sec at the end of my second year of university, they, they did accounting internships, uh, interviews for accounting inter internships. And I thought, you know what, let me see if I get a job. There was four big firms. Let me see if I can get a job at one of these big four firms. And then from there, if I get a job, I'll just go into accounting. How hard could it be? So I luckily got a job uh, with Ernst & Young it, after my, so it was in between my third year and my fourth year, but really like I got the job early third year. So I thought, oh, I'm set. This is great. I don't have to worry about anything else. And then I didn't pay attention in school and there was all sorts of other challenges. But, uh, but anyways, I ended up at Ernst & Young. I survived. And, <laughs> survive uh, is a great term. <laughs> and I survived. Yeah. It was great. Uh, you know, I, there was a lot of good people that I met and I learned the language of business. Uh, I had my own challenges through accounting. I didn't love what I was doing. And so as soon as I started my first day at Ernst & Young, I knew I can't stay in this forever. But why don't I learn as much as I can, get my CPA designation and then move on? And that's exactly what I did. So little did I know that 
you know, whatever, five years later, I'd actually be a bean counter. That's what they call accountants, bean counters. Now I'm actually counting beans at West Coast Seed. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, I tried everything to get away from accounting, and now I'm right back into it. But no, uh, so then I went to HSBC. At Ernst & Young, we were working with a lot of big public companies, you know, yep. $2 billion in revenue. And I felt like I couldn't really get a good idea of the big picture. I was always stuck in one department or one area that I was working on, and I had a really tough time grasping the big picture. And so I thought, you know, I probably – I want to work at a company where I can make more of an impact. And so that's why yeah. I moved to HSBC to, to study companies in the mid market. Uh, I, I, I never intended on staying at HSBC. I feel bad because some of my colleagues were probably, Oh, you told us you wanted to stay. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, I never intended on staying at HSBC. It was more like a learning experience for myself. And yeah. I think they got some good years out of me. Thank you. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, so so I learned a lot about companies that were more, you know, in the 50 to 250 million in revenue size, still fairly big companies for Canada, but I was able to get a better sense of, you know, the overall big picture. And then it's actually my father-in-law who owns West Coast Seeds. He bought West Coast Seeds in 2014. And I remember very fondly, we went out for uh lunch one day he called me randomly when i was at hsbc aaron like we need to meet for lunch said, <laughs> wow like, an important lunch <laughs> yeah like i love you you're a great guy but like why are we going for lunch today i have a lot of work to do like i can't do this and he's like no no we gotta go for lunch and that's when he presented me with the opportunity to work with west coast seeds and i jumped on it and uh it's been it's been great so i was the director of finance for yeah three four years we cleaned up the financial statements made a little bit of a sophistication and now selling seeds as the president of West Coast Seeds and Urban Bee Supplies. And and for people who are, are listening, because uh, most of our listeners right now are are more uh, Eastern Canada and, and you're from uh, BC, uh, can you tell us just a little bit more about, you know, what is West Coast Seed and what type of synergies uh, do you have right now with uh, your other venture, uh, Urban Bee Supplies? Yeah, so... As simple as it is, West Coast Seed sells vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. We sell them in small packages that you would see at a garden center. So uh, it's a really simple operation. We, we buy our seeds, we package them up, and we sell them. So when I moved to the company, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's so easy and everything. And then um, every company has its own challenges. And There's a lot here. I mean, our catalog is huge. We sell a lot of products. Uh, the low dollar value is challenging. And yeah. as a result, we're shipping out a lot of product. I mean, I think we're Canada Post's best friend because <laughs> we're shipping a lot with Canada Post and they, they keep calling us a huge company. And I want to say, no, 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 we're not a huge company. Our average dollar value on, on a sale isn't that big. So yeah. we're actually you know, more of a mid, mid-sized company. But, uh, but that's, what the, that's what we do. You know, we, we like to we like to say we want to go beyond the seed. We're not just a seed company. We're a lifestyle oh. brand. Oh, yeah. And we're we're focused on organics. We're focused on sustainability. We're focused on mental health. There's a lot of mental health therapeutic um, elements of gardening and being in your in your backyard. And and obviously we've seen that through COVID-19. People are stuck and they're in their backyards. Yeah. And when we bought Urban Bee Supplies, uh, we also own a company called Pine Bush Home and Garden. They do bird feeders out of Ontario. They're strictly okay. wholesale. And then we own another company called Renee's Garden out of the U.S. And they, they do a similar thing to us. But basically, we want to take over people's backyards. And it just so happens that as COVID-19 hit, people are yes. stuck in their backyard. So it was good timing in that regard. Oh, yeah. I did I did a garden with my girlfriend this uh, this summer. I never did one uh, before. But uh, but now, because we have time and, and the space to do it, like, yeah, let's let's do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although, uh, I don't know if I saw your name on our customer list. So I'll have to, we'll have to talk Not about yet, that. But, oh. but, but I will, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Too much customer, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, see, this is how you get a sale. You just desperately ask while people are on the air. <laughs> Say yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm currently entering my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and there, there's so much synergy between the two businesses, uh, Urban yep. D Supplies and, and West Coast Seeds. That's where I primar primarily um, pay the most attention to. Um, I'm not as involved with um, 
pine bush and renees, but people who garden often beekeep and people who beekeep often garden. Um, our beekeeping operation is a little smaller and it's a little more niche, uh, but yep. there's still tons of synergies. There's opportunities on the wholesale side and on the, the e-commerce side. And um, it's something that is new to us. We acquired the company two years ago. And yes. so we haven't seen um, nearly the amount of synergy that we can see. Uh, but right now, you know, it's, it's a fun operation. And, and yeah, as we can get into a little later, selling bees online is uh, is pretty tricky, but it's kind of fun. Yeah, we're going to talk about that later. But uh, yeah, that's that that seems to be a very, uh, <laughs> very niche in terms of, of, of sales point. Um and and just just uh, so we know, um, how did you decided to to focus on e-commerce? Because I know you're selling to distributors also, and you know you, you have a B two B side of your business and also a B two C side. But uh, what was the the idea behind going you know direct to consumer with with the e-commerce? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would love to take credit for it, but actually, under the previous owner prior to 2014, they were doing like. A pretty good amount online. Okay. Uh, I guess the previous owner had made an, an investment in a, a WooCommerce site, uh, okay. a WordPress WooCommerce site, and it, it worked really well for them at the time. And when my father-in-law bought the company, that was one of the things he looked at as a potential opportunity. We just saw e-commerce, and it's a small product. Most yes. of the time, we're shipping like a really small product. It's not like clothes where you have to try it on. Returns are pretty small. And so it is a perfect product to ship online. You don't have to taste it or test it or anything like that. For the most part, uh, you know, if we can guarantee that it'll grow, uh, we can have customers for life. So it makes a lot of sense. And I wouldn't say that it's our only focus. I mean, we pay attention to all the areas of our business and we think like similar to the way that like the earth is and the circle of life and the circle of nature it's the same circle for business, right? Like the omni-channel business approach really works for us. As we open a store, uh, people in that area can, you know, get it, get an idea. They can feel the packet. They can see us. We do education. Now we're doing a lot of that yeah. online. We bring people into our wholesale stores. Our wholesale accounts are really cool because a lot of garden centers have a big customer base and a strong customer base. Yep. So a customer would go into a garden center that they trust. They would see our brand uh, at that garden center and they would say, hey, this is really cool. I trust the garden center. So as a result, I trust West Coast Seeds. And yeah. then they may come onto our website and buy, but they may come, they might buy from our wholesaler. Uh, and we want them yeah. to have an integrated and similar experience. So it all kind of works together. Um, and as we expand out east into Ontario first and hopefully Quebec soon, uh, once we sort out our French packet situation, then... Um, and that's how that's how we'll approach it. Oh, that's uh, that's very interesting. And in, in talking about about sales, um, how do you approach selling alive bees on your website and and other fresh products? So, what's uh, what's your process for people that are you know selling foods or other type of stuff that are you know sensible in terms of of timing and also to to be kept alive? So, if you can give some some tips and how was the process to how was the process? Yeah. yeah, it's it's tough. It's definitely tough. But I think a couple of things. Number one is I always think there's a better way. And I, I think the company as a whole always thinks there's a better way. And whenever I hear, oh, that's impossible, that's when I get even more intense. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to prove you wrong. And so, you know, there's tons of products that we still don't sell. So we don't sell actual seedlings. Like okay. Plant, like planted seeds online, okay. which I think is a huge opportunity for us. And it's not something that we plan to do anytime soon, but we're never going to say no to those opportunities. And I think it's it's something that we, we can always strive to do. Right now, we do a lot of, so we sell a lot of products on, on what we call pre-orders. Yep. So customer goes to our website. We don't actually have any inventory. We try our best to tell the customer, hey, this is a pre-ordered product. You're not going to get it right away. But the communication around pre-orders is really hard. It's not something that's pre-built in a lot of these e-commerce tools. And <laughs> and we're, we're so we use Shopify, we use ShipStation, we use yep. a variety of other tools within our tech stack. Yep. And all of them need to be aligned in order to show um, that like that this item is a pre-order item and that you're not going to get it right away. 
And so oftentimes, like I love to say we're perfect, but we do not do a great job of sometimes explaining the, the pre-order situation to our customers, especially ones that have never bought from us before. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so that's one thing is pre-ordering is, is great and it's important and it's an amazing tool, but you have to make sure that you're touching every area of customer communication around pre-orders, but it also enables so much opportunity. Um, we're, we're thinking of new ways of reaching out to our customers that have purchased on pre-ordered products and how to get them excited for the product that they're going to get. And some of the e-commerce brands that I follow and I admire, they do a great job of that. And then in, in regards to actually shipping these challenging products, we work a lot with the government. Um, we contact um, our government agencies, the ones that are relevant in agriculture, to figure out how yeah. and what's legal to ship. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and we try to like keep keep things as, as high quality as possible. We do a lot of testing beforehand. We have a lot of experienced gardeners and a lot of experienced beekeepers that can help us. We sell mason bees, they're frozen bees. So we have to keep them cold as they go out to Ontario. There are certain products that can't get cold, so we can't ship them when things are frozen. So we, now we have to understand weather patterns across oh. Canada and the United States. Okay, that's so, that's important. So, so the bees are frozen before... You, you ship For them. mason bees. So mason bees are like okay. not pollen. They're pollinators, but they don't make honey. So okay. you put them in like little tubes and they pollinate your, your garden. Okay. Honey bees, which is urban bee supplies, those we, we ship live. Okay. Um, so we don't ship um, like hives with full bees yeah, yeah. in them. I get it. Yeah. Those are pickup only. Oh, yeah. but we do. They, they come in from Australia. And they come in these tubes and you get bees flying all around. The key is the queen. Yeah. The worker bees will all stay around the queen. So you pin the queen in a like non-harmful way. And all the bees go in, in and support the queen. And that's very interesting. Experience. It's really cool. Like if, if anybody's ever in Vancouver and wants to check it out, it's around March. Come in and you can I'll give you a tour of the bee the bees coming in and we, we ship them out. It's really cool. But that's, that's cool. Um, How does just just for fun? I heard that uh, a, a queen worth a lot. How, how does a, a queen work? Yeah, on queens, the market. Good queens, question. Yeah. Uh, we sell them for a variety of different ranges depending on like the quality of the queen. Uh, but typically, so you can sell like a, a, a hive with a lot of worker bees, or you can sell, and they call those nukes. Or you could sell the individual queen if like the hive is, is doing well and then the queen died or the queen left or was killed or yeah. whatever. There's a variety of different things. I'm not a beekeeping expert myself. But you can buy queens to just inject into your hive, hope that it takes, and then you know they have a new queen that they, that they work for. So um, we sell a lot of those. And there's things called queen banks. So okay. we're trying to create a queen bank where you can create queens um, and like okay. harvest queens as opposed to all the other types of bees. So you're not necessarily making honey, you're just making queens. It's, it's a crazy business. Oh yeah, I, I'm learning is. every day and I, I'm not a beekeeper, but I find it fascinating. I think it's the coolest thing. And whether that area of the business does well or not, I still think we're supporting an amazing oh, thing. Yes. I think pollinators are super important for our ecosystem. And so, you know, ideally we make money on urban bee and we do great and everything's great. But <laughs> It works with what we're doing at West Coast Seed, so it's just like part and parcel. It all works together. That's that's very interesting. And b before you were talking about logistics, and and we met uh, together because we we work on a ship station project of implementation. Uh, and and I know that you had some some logistic challenge in the past, but can you tell us? Uh, What has been the biggest, you know, logistic, logistic challenge uh, for you since the beginning of uh, of uh, of your role in in WCS, and and how did you solve that uh, issue? I don't think we ever really solve issues. I uh, know <laughs> we're, we're always working on making things better. Am I allowed to plug you here? Oh yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, you should work with Phil. Uh, He, he's done a great job of supporting us and our uh, ecosystem, getting our tech stack set up. And and uh, especially as it relates to ShipStation, that was a huge help to us. Thank you. Uh, we've been able to change uh, our entire um, order flow and, and logistics around this tool. And so it's been it's been super helpful. But anyway, 
that's probably the biggest challenge that we had. Although we have tons of logistics challenges, whether it's again, the pre-order products or whether it's picking orders that are 800 lines long. Most businesses, you know, a shoe company, they're lucky if they get one shoe order, like, like a shoe order, an order with more than one pairs of shoes on them. Oh, yeah. For us, we're getting 800 lines, which creates <laughs> challenges. We're getting like oh, yeah. quantity, massive quantities, although the dollar value is small, it still makes it harder from a logistics standpoint. Oh, yeah. um, so there's a variety of things, but yeah, like, you know, we were having, cl- like, we measured the amount of clicks that it takes to do everything. Mm-hmm. And so with the implementation of ShipStation, we were able to remove probably like 12 to 15 clicks to get yep. to maybe two um, in a normal scenario. Uh, and then another thing that I was told uh, from somebody that I really admire, they were like, focus on the 70% of situations that are normal. Focus on the, the situation that's most normal. Iron that one out, clean it up. The ones that are, are challenging, the ones that you screw up, it, it, it takes so long to fix those. So start at the ones that you, 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 can, you can nail and then try to increase those percentages. So go from 70 to 75 to 80 to 85 to 90. Because if you're focused on those 30 and trying to problem solve each one, it's just a disaster. I mean, it, yeah. those problem issues, I, I understand customers contact us all the time saying like, we didn't get our order and I feel horrible. I feel we're, but it's always some weird thing that happened in our system. It's not anything that our, anybody personally did to that customer. It's just like a weird system flaw. And yeah. we're trying to iron those out to reduce those amount of issues. And yeah, it's so and, hard. And at, at a certain point, you know, automation is very cool. But at the end, if, you know, someone forget the paper in the warehouse or something right. and you just miss the order you miss the order and when you get the thousand order per day you know that's that's something that i think it's normal so you n- just need to track that to make sure that most of the clients are are satisfied and sometimes it it can happen and for people that that didn't understand the part where when aaron was saying that uh over 800 you know lines per per order figure that out in your head right now so if if imagine if when you you had an order you had to pick 800 different items in your warehouse, how you should optimize that and what would be the process to do it. And that's, that's exactly what we did. So that's uh that was a big, uh, what wasn't a piece of cake. <laughs> we're still making optimizations. Oh yeah. We will. So oh, yeah. we're talking about, like I always say, our competitors are, are utilizing AI and robotics. And I mean, our competitors like Amazon, which, it's a competitor. Um, it's a full on competitor, but at the same time, they're a little different scale, but we're still using paper and Excel and we're trying to move away from that wherever possible to utilize new tools. But at the same time, it's, it's hard. And I, we always say it's like the wild west. Nobody, there's no simple solution. Uh, the, the process of choosing a new technology, choosing a partner to work with, it's really hard. And it, can completely change the dynamic of your organization in a matter of a minute uh, as soon as you sign that paper to work with a vendor or to work with a new uh, technology tool. Yep. Uh, and so those decisions we don't take lightly. And I feel like we've figured out ways to optimize that decision-making process, but we're still we're still always trying to make changes. I, I think you, you have a very great mindset to always look at things you can improve and, and you know, grow by by that so that's very interesting and and just you know talking about growth uh if if we switch a bit from logistics to marketing because i know lots of of our uh, listeners uh would love to hear some good marketing strategies um so far can you tell us what uh what helped you in terms of uh growing your, your you know your customer acquisition so what what are your good strategies to to get new customers and and be known and discovered by by new clients? Yeah, I'm I'm like smiling here because you're not gonna like my answer, and I don't know <laughs> if people listening are gonna like my answer either. But <laughs> the the truth is, the real truth is luck is like full on luck. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, we got so lucky, and I feel for like I don't. COVID is terrible and it's impacted yeah. our lives very negatively mm-hmm. um, for the most part. And I feel horrible for um, a variety of different reasons, obviously around the COVID 
pandemic situation, but it has benefited our business. You know, as I was saying earlier, uh, we're trying to take over people's backyards and people are stuck in their backyard. So uh, we've seen a massive increase in demand for uh, gardening and garden seeds. And it's been well documented that our industry has uh, grown. And so I don't know if it's anything that we're doing versus our competitors. Um, they're also seeing tremendous growth as well. So that, that has definitely helped. Now, what are strategies that we have done that we believe have also worked? I mean, yep. we, for a long time, we were selling a product. We were selling seeds. Yep. And I think there's a big difference between selling seeds and selling the lifestyle of yep. gardening. And I think that's really what has like changed the dynamic of our organization for the better. Instead of, you know, we're still focusing on our high quality product. Like there's no doubt about it. We do an immense amount of testing around our product to make sure it's the highest quality. And I'm very confident in our product. And I think it starts with the product. You have to have a good product. You can't sit like, it's very hard to sell something that isn't good in today's society. People want high quality products. However, um, we've gone beyond the product to then focus on the other elements. There's like a big cooking element to gardening. Uh, there's the actual therapeutic side that I spoke about earlier. There's the environmental part. There's the poll like supporting pollinators part. There's the local part. And we're trying to tell stories and, uh, of these things. So let's pick a really cool customer that's doing something awesome to support pollinators. Let's, let's talk about um, uh, a charity that we're working with that's doing something awesome, a community garden that has like a variety of different people and they're all rallying around gardening or, or uh, a chef that does farm seed to table stuff. So telling stories about these people um, and about why people use West Coast seeds, I think is a great strategy uh, for us. And it's something that I think has paid off, although COVID helps. Yeah, of course. And and in terms of, of behavior changes, um, have you noticed something uh, from your customer? Of course, they're buying more or, you know, people's are, are, are now now searching for uh for seeds of course online but for your you know recurring orders have you have you seen something maybe it's it's a secret but but on, on your hand have you seen uh, any type of behavior change i mean there's a billion different behavior changes i think i think the coolest part about like i don't know life now is that things are changing so fast i mean when I think it's such a weird time right now, uh, thinking about last year at this time before COVID, I would have never, never, ever guessed as to where we are today. And I'd use that as a model for our marketing efforts and kind of everything that we do. Like we can't just say, okay, this is, this is going to work for five years because things change so fast. So there's always new things that we're learning. You know, right now we're seeing a lot of new gardeners. So we're trying okay. to change some of our efforts a lot of the things that we do cater to a more senior gardener, somebody who uh, has gardened before. Some, some of the things that we do within our organization allow people who have bought from us before to have a better understanding of how to buy and what to buy. But what we're trying to do is cater to a newer gardener, right? We want to, there's such a trend for millennials to start gardening and they have young families they're buying homes um, outside yeah. of you know the city but also within the city there's new technology to be able to have indoor gardens and patio gardens and we're seeing a lot of people growing in containers on their patios and trying to support pollinators on their patios there's like a billion different things that we're seeing in the marketplace that's changing and we're trying to like I don't even want, I don't want to be a leader even like we just want to be able to keep up with all the changes. And oh, yeah. uh, I think we're doing a great job of it. And I think our team has done a fantastic job of figuring out what these trends are and, and, and in some, in some respects setting those trends. So yeah, it's cool. That's a uh, very, uh, an, an humble answer, but uh, I think you're, you're doing great in your, your industry, to be honest. I, I've, uh, I've looked at uh, other competitors and <laughs> I can tell that uh, your website is is a 
is pretty uh, performant. So that's that's pretty cool. And and your brand also. And we're going to talk more about your, uh, you know, all your strategies around it. But uh, uh, just before, uh, because I know that some of our listeners are more a B2B oriented business. Um, how do you you split your marketing efforts or, you know, your strategy between, you know, B2B versus B2C? And just just if you can give us little tips about it. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, we we still don't have the optimal level of like what where to go. I mean, we kind of we always say, you know, where's the fire? Okay, here's the issue. Like, let's fix it right now. Uh, we're always playing catch up. I think this year through COVID, we've kind of shut down a lot of our marketing efforts on you know like this season. So we're not trying to market to customers right now because we're having fulfillment issues because our, yeah. our market has grown so much. So um, that's given us time to consider more of how we're going to approach marketing in the future. And I think there's an unbelievable opportunity on the B2B side to yes. utilize e-commerce and to utilize new marketing tools. I mean, our industry is pretty, um, I don't know, not, not that quick to adapt to technology. So I think there's unbelievable opportunities by um, utilizing new technology and new marketing uh, trends and efforts and getting creative on how to work with your B2B customers. You know, is there opportunities where you can work with their social teams? Um, is there opportunities that you can uh, just e easy stuff, give them tools to be able to market your product? Like we want our customers saying we we are proud to carry Wesco seeds and we want people to come to the store to say, Hey, you guys have to carry Wesco seeds. Um, and so we try to figure out ways of, of doing that, we try to be different from our competitors. You know, the Dr. Bonnie Henry seed packet has driven a lot of people into our wholesale accounts. Okay. Um, That's interesting. We, At first it yeah, was a B2C, you know, campaign, I guess. And, and no, it's like full on, full on B 2 B as well, and, oh, and wow. so we get a lot of customers that are at. Um, we get a lot of our wholesale customers saying, "We really want that packet," and it drives people into their store. So they're, you know, they're not making anything off that packet because we're donating a hundred percent of the sales to charity, but they're asking for it <laughs> because that's amazing. Into their store, and then they're buying other stuff. So there's like tons of strategies out there that we're. I, what we don't want to do is get into like the same strategies that everybody else does, you know, discounting or some other incentive like tool to be able to incentivize customers. We want to, we want to come up with new strategies and um, there's still, there's obviously um, you obviously have to continue to do things, you know, the same way that you've done them in the past in certain cases, but there's also opportunities for innovation and that's what I love. And uh, we're going to continue to try to do that. That's, that's very interesting. And do you do a, a lot of uh, email marketing and marketing automations around the business? Uh, because I, I think you you got a lot of recurring customers uh, because you know seeds it's it's live. You want to always uh, have new seeds and new plants to to grow. So um, how are you using email marketing and what what you've learned about it? Yeah, we do use email marketing. I mean, I think it's an amazing tool uh, to be able to reach your customers. Although we're definitely on the like lower end of sending out emails we don't want to overwhelm customers we don't want to annoy customers and i think okay. for four or five years that was a big push like don't don't overwhelm customers mm -hmm. some companies send out way too many emails and i found over the past four years since i started here customers are a lot more happy to receive emails there's like you know gmail has an auto filter tool to like filter promotions so you're not necessarily overwhelmed And so I found that, you know, we can send more if we want to, but we prefer not to. We want to send powerful uh, newsletters. So we want to make sure that there's a purpose for everything that we're doing and we focus on that purpose. And if there's no purpose, then we don't send out a tool. I mean, I'd love to be able to send out daily newsletters and I'm sure it may result into increased sales, but it's also going to annoy people and... Yeah. We don't want to just, we don't, we pride ourselves on education and community and sustainability. And that just does, doesn't vibe with, with oh, yeah. For sure. sending out emails. 
but but that's uh, that's very interesting uh, in terms of thinking. Uh, lots of uh, lots of people think like that, but other you know when you you look at Amazon and you know Walmart and all the the big chain, if you subscribe, you'll get like three up to four email a day. So <laughs> that's uh, that's insane. And at a certain point, I think you're losing a little bit of impact. Not a little bit, lots of impact of when you're sending an email. If, if as you say, you send some uh, some some training, some some uh, cool stuff around your products, and uh, you know your 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 customers are expecting your newsletter. That's when you create you know a, a certain momentum on on your newsletter, and I think you're gonna increase your open rate, your your click rate, and your conversion rate, of course, at, at that point for sure. So that's uh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity for segmentation there as well. Like, uh, also, why don't you yeah. ask your customers what what do they want? To, like, when they sign up, and we don't do this, but I've seen some of our competitors do it, and I think it's a great idea. But like, how many emails do you want to receive? What kind of gardener are you? Are you an expert, or are you an an intermediate, or a junior? Like, where do you live? Um, and and so there's tons of ways of segmenting um, the customer bases to then send emails. Based on what people want, personalization, that's like huge. Yeah, yeah. A, a brand that I like a lot is called Sitka. I don't know if you heard of, but they are like, uh, it's a hunting gear, uh, selling, they are selling hunting gear. And uh, I, I'm a waterfall, so duck hunter. And, and when I subscribed to their newsletter, I told them that I was a duck hunter. But, but now they're sending me emails that they know I'm a duck hunter and I'm really targeted, but also they try to bring me, you know, on big game, so so uh, deer hunting and other stuff, and they know, and they are adapting their email. We know you're not a, a deer hunter, but have a look about, and and they're they're trying to move me into other segmentation, and that's the way they're doing it is very funny. So I really uh, really enjoy that. But segmentation is the key, I guess. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, to be honest, most of the strategies that we utilize, like I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I read a lot of books and I talk to a lot of people, but most of the stuff um, as to like the strategies that we implement are just us being consumers. So I've given, yeah. you know, our, our IT, like our third party developer, I said, yeah, yeah go buy this product because I bought it and I had a really cool experience and I want you to see that experience for yourself and be able to potentially implement that into our website. And there's opportunities for newsletters. We're always following, we follow, a lot of our competitors and yes. people within the industry. But we also, I try to follow just really cool companies that I admire and buy stuff online and, you know, experience things in that way uh, from a critical eye. And that's really where we get most of our strategies outside of our normal industry. And I find that to be, first of all, it's fun because you're buying stuff that you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But also it's uh, also it's a great experience and it's great to have a critical eye. And now I do that with everything. I think about the podcast that you're on and or that I'm on that you're doing and how, how it's going to work for you and how you're going to launch it and how you're going to get more brand awareness. And it's probably not going to be having me on it. That's for sure. No, no, no. Yeah. It's it's always the quality of the content, not necessarily the notoriety. I'm not I'm not here to run an interview with Adidas. You know, I'm I'm here to to have fun and to to learn about some specific industry. So, uh, yeah. But but you you're doing something great uh, to be at uh, the step you're you're at. And you know, uh, I read a lot uh, about West Coast Seeds on on the web, and you have a very good reputation also. So it's not always, as you said, not necessarily be the leader necessarily in, in a certain industry, but do things well and, and care about the, the thing that matters to you in terms of value and in terms also of, uh, of, of, of lifestyle around, around the business. So that's, that's very important. And, and leading to, to my next point with, that, with this intro uh, is about your, your social strategy. So you talked to me about uh, a lot about the lifestyle around, you know, uh, West Coast Seeds. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about how you adapt, you know, your your message uh, on on social platforms such as Instagram and also on Facebook, and and what's your thinking behind it? Yeah, I mean, social has been a challenge for us. Okay, it's something that like is really hard to develop content for it to be able to have. You know, one of the biggest challenges that we had that we never even thought about was to curate a community so we had this one staff member that basically like launched our instagram back 
four years ago. And she would always, she would never get stuff done. And I was always so frustrated and I was saying, why aren't you getting stuff done? And she was like, yeah, yeah, I'm commenting on all these Instagram uh, comments that we're getting. And I'm like, don't do that. You're wasting your time. Like just post new content. I don't want you doing that. Don't waste your time. And in hindsight, so sorry, Caroline, you were fully right. Um, Like that is such an amazing tool and that's, it's so wrong the way I was thinking and we want to build a community. And as a result, we need to be getting back to people and they're so excited to engage with us. That's of very important. We need to get back to us, to them. And so we've put a huge priority over the past two years of, of figuring out how to respond to people. And so like marketing is posting, but then who's commenting? A lot of the questions are like garden specific questions that our marketing team doesn't know. But customer service is busy answering the phones. And so we've had really like a challenging time figuring out who can do this job? And luckily we found some people that can do a great job. And I think that's something that is always underrated um, about social media is it's not just about the cool picture or the cool story you're telling. It's about building a community. And we haven't found that social leads to that many sales. Um, and that could be something that we're doing wrong. That could be industry, industry-wise, we, we don't know and, and we don't really care. We love building this community. It's fun. It's hard. I mean, it's like the one thing that every single person in the staff member can see in our staff community can see. So like a staff, if I make an accounting entry wrong, a staff member isn't going to see that. And they're not going to like say, Aaron, you you can't do accounting. You know, nobody gets insight into that. But on social, everybody sees all of our staff members follow. So there's it's such a critical job and so many people have so many opinions on it. This is a tough one. And it is. We, we are always trying to figure out ways of getting better. And, and content development is also challenging, especially in a seasonal business. Like oh, yes. I mean, in, in Quebec, it's hard. It's harder than in Vancouver, but even so, like we can't take pictures of a garden in January yeah. So we have to plan out six months in advance as to what we're going to plan. In, so like indoor we garden, maybe? <laughs> yeah, so, so if we wanted to do a promotion around Mother's Day, let's say, and yeah. say, hey, buy your seeds for Mother's Day, we and, and we would have to grow it in advance. This Dr. Bonnie Henry product that we um, curated, we had tough times actually getting product photography because we couldn't grow it because we started the program in October. And so that creates a lot of challenges as well from a social social perspective. Oh, yeah. Um, and, yeah, so we're having to plan things out in advance, and we're using a lot of tools that are, are helping a lot, like uh, social posting tools and yeah. um, uh, customer service tools that enable What are the tools? To, uh, you can name drop tools if you want. To, it can be very helpful, uh, helpful for... Sure. I mean, like, like, a, like a Hootsuite that enables you to... Yeah. Um, we use a later it's similar uh, product, but we've used a variety of different tools. It's kind of dependent on who's running our social at, at any given time. And um, we have uh, Gorgeous we use for our customer service yep. chat tool, and um, it enables our staff members to con- communicate through a variety of different means within one tool. And so it's yep. helped us respond to customers much, much better than using like traditional email. So we've got, we use a variety of different tools and uh, most of them integrate with each other, which is another huge thing and something that we, um, you know, we have like a a tech stack, we call it, and we have an IT roadmap and we try to make sure that that roadmap ties to our tech stack and that most of the tools can integrate. And if they can't integrate automatically, how can we get them to integrate so that we have one system that, that works simultaneously although it doesn't really work like that yeah that's 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 cool to to know that a president of a company like you is very involved into you know technical and marketing decision that's that's very interesting to to see and i think it it will help to lead the company the you know the the, the best way um just a, another question that i have a top of mind 
um, you were talking about, you know, uh, a huge growth in interest in terms of B2B uh, sale. Um, I know you've you've been on, on Amazon. I think you're selling a, a, a little bit on Amazon. Um, and have you tested the B2B feature of Amazon in terms of selling or, or not? No, we haven't. And we're, we're off of Amazon for now. Oh, uh, we just you're in. Okay. Yeah, when COVID-19 happened, we couldn't fulfill fast enough. So okay. we're off of Amazon right now. Um, it's something that's sad because actually a lot of customers in Quebec were buying on Amazon. I, I don't know why. I think maybe because the translation. Um, yes, that, it's it's automated. Uh, yeah, the translation. So we didn't have to like worry about it or anything like that. And so that's hurt our business in, in Quebec in particular. But um I don't know. Yeah, we haven't used it. We, there are some cool B 2 B opportunities that mm -hmm. we have um, with different like delivery type companies, and uh, there's some new B 2 B e commerce uh, selling platforms that we're looking into. But um, yeah, we're trying to stay at the forefront of what's going on, but things are moving so fast. Uh, yes, and our product. Our product is great. It's very small and it's high quality and everything, but it's very challenging to ship into certain places, into the U.S. in particular. It's an agricultural product, so we can't just easily ship everything into the U.S. Um, so that that creates challenges. Um, of course. And there's a variety of other challenges, like getting stuff into Quebec with with French on the packet. So, what what would be the best advice you can give to? someone that would have to you know get into a new role into a business that you know runs an uh, e-commerce and that that person would have the challenge to you know um increase the sales and what what would be the the, the first steps i know it's outside of the question that i ask you but it's another question that i have top of mind and i'm pretty sure you can answer that so, yeah for sure this is like something i'm super passionate about first yeah. of all i love shopify yeah I'm a big Shopify fan. I don't know why. I think it's a little bit of Canadian pride. Uh, Never also, heard of, but yeah, I, th I guess it's a CMS of e-commerce or something like that. Pardon me? <laughs> I, I never heard of Shopify, but uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's an amazing tool. And uh, we we changed, as I said before, like we were on WooCommerce for a while and we moved. And ever since that move, site speed, we, we had all these things that I had never, like all these technical issues with our old site that I just never had to deal with when we moved on to Shopify. Uh, I'm like, oh, you don't need hosting? Like, why not? Like, they're like, well, we host stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's that's great. That's way better. So we, we, we never have issues with crashing or anything like that. Yeah. There's also a great ecosystem that they have with different apps. They provide you with tons of different, like, um, events networking events that you can meet other people they have a shopify facebook group a slack group and so i'm on i'm on this facebook group probably every day reading all these questions and i should be participating more but i'm always embarrassed about my questions because they're way less technical than some of the people on there but it's yeah. unbelievable and, and you get an idea when you see these cool brands like that are on shopify yeah. you kind of get an idea of like what the optimal tech stack is from yes. the other Shopify customers. And that's a and very good like, point. Mm. Yeah, I'm just picking and choosing based on what I see everybody, what the trends are and what we need. And that's been amazing. And then also, as I said earlier, like the fun part is like actually buying stuff. So allocate a budget if you don't want to spend it on your own. Um, allocate a budget to buying stuff and buy stuff. If you have to return it, I mean, that sucks, but return it. But I try to do my best to be a consumer and have a critical eye. And as I said earlier, I have no, I'm an accountant. I have no e-commerce training in at all. My training is just by buying stuff and going and talking to as many people in e-commerce. I like love having these type of chats. I think we chatted during the ship station integration, like about other e-commerce stuff all the time. Oh yeah. And I, I leverage our developer all the time and just always hypothesize different ideas. And I love it. I think it's just so fun and it's such a cool opportunity. And then as soon as you start seeing like your efforts actually working, it gives you like a high, You're like, Oh my gosh, people are actually like seeing me, oh, yeah. seeing the stuff that we're doing and they're buying. And I'm like, Whoa, that's so cool. I can't believe people are following the stuff that we're doing. This is unbelievable. And then when you hear, 
oh, West Coast Seeds is great or West Coast Seeds is doing something that nobody else is doing or whatever. It's just like shocking. Like, wow. I never yeah. thought of myself like that. I never thought of our brand like that. So. Yeah. I, I think one of the thing that makes me passionate about e-commerce is when you launch, you know, a new promotion or a new, a new release and you see just a, a sales spike such as if you're investing into stock market and you see your, your, the stock you're holding that grew like 20, 30, 30% in the day, like the Bitcoins these days. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so insane. So uh, I wish everybody that is listening to us that would someday will feel what is a Black Friday or, <laughs> or that type of, of, of event that uh, can just transmit the passion about it. Yeah. And we don't even... We don't even have Black Friday like success traditionally, and oh no, okay. We've, we've had a variety of different like the Dr. Henry thing was amazing. Yep. You see orders spiking, and there's so many other events that we've had that have just like spiked sales or um, spiked interest, and it's just it's so cool. Yeah, it is. And as you mentioned uh, earlier, you're really looking into you know Facebook groups. You're listening podcasts. You're reading books, but uh, what would be your your best go to in terms of of knowledge to to stay up to date? Is it the, the Facebook group of Shopify, or it, what what would be the the if you have only one thing to keep to stay up to date? Would it be Google or the, the Facebook group? What what would, yeah, it, would I be? Think, I, don't, I mean, I'm pretty passionate about this Facebook group. It, it's pretty cool what they've developed, and there's tons of different customers, um, like Shopify customers, talking about their stories and figuring out you know, benefits of, of e-com. I mean, I've joined some like private groups with friends yeah. and other, other things like that, but yeah, probably this Facebook group. I, I love it. I love, I love when people don't get along and I just follow the pickering. Yes. It's really fun. And, That's very interesting. By the way, just to let you know, uh, it's, it's in French, but we've created that type of group in Quebec Uh, it's called Communauté e-commerce Québec for people that are listening to us. I know you understood because you understand a, a little bit of French. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, we had uh, a huge growth during the last year, I think because of the pandemic. But uh, by now we are uh, around 4,000 members. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And I think uh, it's something that was missing in the industry. And by now, because of the e-commerce event that we, we hold each year and with the group and with the podcast... I think we're transmitting a lot of knowledge uh, during the year with with those those uh, those communication tools. So that's that's very interesting, um, Aaron. That's that's uh, pretty much it. Do you have something that you want to add or uh, an ending note? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> that's my last. Yeah. I mean, check out our website. Obviously, check out our website westcoastseeds.com. We're trying to do some cool stuff. We're really trying to get. Uh, of new new customers we're trying to we're always trying to launch new things we want our website to look different we're amending our product pages right now we're going to rearrange our brand to focus in on um you know kind of a more youthful brand and uh there's tons of cool things that we've got on the horizon we're going to do more of these um partnerships with influencers yeah and not necessarily like dr henry for those of you who don't know is our provincial health officer out of british columbia Okay. I wouldn't say she's a traditional influencer, but she has influence. And oh, yeah. you know, the, the donation packets has been a huge success of ours. And you spoke about it earlier. I mean, we want to continue to do that kind of stuff, giving back to our community. We have four pillars uh, that like hold together our business. Uh, and that's community, education, um, technology, and quality. And so the community part is really important. We're trying to work on more education to get reach into Ontario and Quebec through things like um, virtual happy hours. We have one coming up with a, a lo another local company out of BC that focuses on um, soil and the therapeutic okay. aspects of gardening. So um, yeah, we're trying to, to, to help out as much as possible and be as innovative as possible. If anybody has any cool ideas or, or anything like that, feel free to, uh, contact me. I, I love to, I love to chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron, for joining us today. It was a, a very uh, interesting episode. Uh, so thank you for everyone for being with us and talk to you soon.